At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, but the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He will invade countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land, and many will fall. But these will escape from his power, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of the Ammonites. He will extend his power against the countries, and not even the land of Egypt will escape. He will get control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver, and over all the riches of Egypt. The Libyans and Cushites will also be in submission. But reports from the east and the north will terrify him, and he will go out with great fury to annihilate and completely destroy many. He will pitch his royal tents between the sea and the beautiful holy mountain, but he will meet his end with no one to help him. At that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands watch over your people, will rise up. There will be a time of distress such as never has occurred since nations came into being until that time. But at that time, all your people who are found written in the book will escape. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to shame and eternal contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, keep these words secret and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will roam about and knowledge will increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and two others were standing there, one on this bank of the river and one on the other. One of them said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long until the end of these extraordinary things? Then I heard the man dressed in linen, who was above the waters of the river. He raised both his hands toward heaven and swore by him, who lives eternally, that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. When the power of the holy people is shattered, all these things will be completed. I heard, but did not understand. So I asked, My Lord, what will be the outcome of these things? He said, Go on your way, Daniel, for the words are secret and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. None of the wicked will understand, but the wise will understand. From the time the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, There will be 1,290 days. The one who waits for and reaches 1,335 days is blessed. But as for you, go on your way to the end. You will rest. Then rise to your destiny at the end of the days. Hi, it's Lynn Liaz, and I have a couple different items, well, actually more than a couple, of prophecy-related news. We're going to talk about asteroids. I pulled up a slew of articles pertaining to asteroids in relation to Prophet Ephraim Rodriguez's asteroid prophecy. And these articles I pulled up seem to support his prophecy, so I will show you those. And I've got some other stuff to do with Um, weather-related events, um, darkness over in the UK. And right here on screen, the first human head transplant could take place in 2017, surgeon claims. That's only a few years away. It says an Italian surgeon has claimed the first ever human head transplant could happen in just two years' time, according to reports. Does that sound strange to you? That sounds very eerie to me. It sounds like something out of a horror movie. Um, Reminds me of Frankenstein. 
boy, how far will the medical sciences go? It's crazy. So we're going to talk about these things. Now, right over here, you can see the incredible picture that proves there is life on other planets. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of curious what that's about. Let's look just for the heck of it. That wasn't on my agenda here, but it says this astonishing image is the long awaited proof that alien life does exist. Scientists have sensationally claimed. Okay, it says the never before seen photograph shows a mysterious dragon shaped organism found in space, which they claim also reveals that all life on Earth, including humans, is extraterrestrial in origin. Wow, extraterrestrial in origin. And by the way, if I sound stuffed up, well, it's because I am. I always have that stuffed up sound anyways, but I just got over a cold the other week and it's still lingering. So I apologize to you for that. And I hope that all of my words are clear so that you can hear me very well, because this is some important prophecy news. Anyways, back to the article. It was discovered in dust and particulate matter gathered deep in the Earth's stratosphere. Its finders say it is a biological entity made of carbon and oxygen, the building blocks of life. And the scientist who made the incredible find insist there is no way it could have blown up into space from our planet and so much have originated elsewhere in the universe. It was discovered by Professor Milton Wainwright and his team from the University of Sheffield and the University of Buckingham Center for Astrobiology. Professor Wainwright sent balloons into the stratosphere 27 kilometers above the Earth's atmosphere to collect particles from space. He claimed what they have discovered is not only proof that life exists in outer space, but that extraterrestrial organisms are continually, continually raining down on the Earth. Now, it seems to me, and I could be wrong, but it seems like they might be trying to build a case for this um, upcoming alien false messiah agenda we know about the jesuits and the um, papacy and the whole lucifer telescope um, chris putnam and tom horn discussed that in detail in their book exo vaticana okay and wow it seems like that's what they're trying to um, come up with here let's move along to another article. I'm going to save the asteroids for last because I have a bunch of articles to do with that. Okay, first human head transplant could take place in 2017, surgeon claims. Well, an Italian surgeon has claimed the first ever human head transplant could happen in just two years, according to reports. What does that remind you of? It reminds me of something out of a horror movie or Frankenstein, and it does not sound like something that I want to be around for. Can you imagine bumping into somebody who had a original body they were born with, but a transplanted head? I mean, that's freakish. That is weird. That is nothing that I can imagine that God would ever deem um, as righteous or holy it sounds crazy. It sounds pure satanic, if you ask me. It says, Sergio Canavero is expected to announce plans for the radical proposal at the American Academy of Neurological and Orthopedic uh, Surgeons, AANOS, conference in Maryland, U.S. this June, the new scientist reported. Here in the USA. Ha! Huh, imagine that. And on top of that, just imagine the fact that 2017 is only a few years away. We're already into 2015. It says the technique he would use for the dramatic procedure was published in a paper to the Surgical Neurology International Journal earlier this month. He described how the recipient's head and the donor body would be cooled before the spinal cords being cut and the head moved on to the donor body. So you've got a donor body and a head. Okay, what do they do? Grow the head? I don't know. The ends of the spinal cord would then be fused together. This is really strange, if you ask me. Forgive me, I've got to read this, okay? I mean, this is just crazy. 
the person would then be placed into a coma for around four weeks to prevent them from moving while they heal. Can you imagine, um, gee, I don't like the way my face looks, so I think I want a new head. Would you even be the same person? I don't think so. What would that do to a person's soul or their spirit? Um, you've got your body that you were born with. Meanwhile, you've got someone else's head with someone else's brain on your body. Would the person's memory still be there if it came from a person or does it come from a genetically modified head? Are they growing heads in labs somewhere? I mean, gee, it seems to me like medical science is really trying to stay ahead of everything. I mean, I don't understand this. It says, uh, Mr. Canavero said the patient should be able to move and feel their face when they wake up and should be able to speak with the same voice. He revealed that he wants to use the surgery to help those who have suffered degeneration of the muscles and nerves or those who have advanced cancer. He told the new scientist, if society doesn't want it, I won't do it. But if people don't want it in the U.S. or Europe, that doesn't mean it won't be done somewhere else. I'm trying to go about this the right way. But before going to the moon, you want to make sure people will follow you. It says that he first proposed this idea in 2013. However, some critics have questioned whether he proposed uh, or whether the proposed procedure would actually work. Harry Goldsmith, a clinical professor of neurological surgery at the University of California, Davis, told the new scientist, I don't believe it will ever work. There are too many problems with the procedure. Trying to keep someone healthy in a coma for four weeks, it's not going to happen. In 1970, scientists completed a head transplant using a monkey in Cleveland, U.S. The monkey survived for nine days but died after its immune system rejected the head. Huh. Well, probably from their perspective, if the person's got advanced brain cancer or something like that, um, they're going to die anyway, so what have they got to lose? That's probably what they base it on. I mean, I can understand what they're trying to say, but that is just totally, totally freaky, if you ask me. Next on the list, biggest ever black hole found. Astronomers discover abyss 12 billion times bigger than the sun. Astronomers have captured the biggest black hole ever discovered in the early universe. There's a photo. This is a photo of an artist impression of a supermassive black hole at the entire, or excuse me, at the center of a distant quasar. So this is not a real photo. It is an artist rendition. The ancient object is 12 billion times the mass of our sun, pumping out a million billion times the energy of our sun. It was powering a distant galaxy called a quasar, the study published in Nature Revealed. At a distance of 12.8 billion light years from Earth, the quasar was formed only 900 million years after the Big Bang. Dr. Fuyan Bian of the Australian National University in Canberra said the discovery challenges theories of how black holes form and grow in the early universe. He said, forming such a large black hole so quickly is hard to interpret with current theories. A quasar is an extremely bright cloud of material in the process of being sucked into a black hole. The material heats up as it accelerates toward it, emitting an extraordinary amount of light, which actually pushes away stuff falling behind it. Now, Dr. Bean said this process known as radiation pressure is believed to limit the growth rate of black holes. He said, however, this black hole at the center of the quasar gained enormous mass in a short period of time. Okay, so that's all on that. But speaking of the sun, I've got some other news for you. Actually, I've got two articles for you. Number one, blackout warning. The biggest solar eclipse since 1999 could lead to power cuts across Europe. It says blackouts could ripple through parts of Europe next month when the UK is plummeted into darkness by a total eclipse of the sun energy experts have warned. Okay, so what does that mean? What does that mean for the UK and why? Well, it says in what will be the biggest solar eclipse since 1999, 85% of the sun will be blocked by the moon in parts of the UK. But 
As the science community gather to observe the incredible phenomenon on March 20th, experts have warned that power supplies could suddenly drop. The National Grid have announced that solar power output across Britain will have, or excuse me, will have during this event. While little power comes from solar energy in the UK, other parts of Europe could see themselves thrusted into darkness. The European network transmission system operators for electricity said the risk of incident cannot be completely ruled out. Solar eclipses have happened before, but with the increase of installed photovoltaic energy generation, the risk of an incident could be serious without appropriate countermeasures. However, the organization reassured it had been planning ahead to suppliers across Europe and can provide more energy from other power stations during the event. Across some parts of Europe, around 90% of the sun will be blocked during the hours of the eclipse. Okay, um, so it finally says the event kick off around 840 AM GMT and will last two hours with the next one taking place in 2026. Well, I don't know about most of you, but I don't feel that the earth is going to be the same in 2026 as it is right now. Now, some more uh, weather related news. What global warming? Now the sea is freezing. Astounding pictures show nearly frozen waves. What's up with that? What's up with all this craziness? We've got head transplants about to take place if they approve it. We've got a blackout in Great Britain possibly coming due to a solar eclipse. I mean, asteroids. We've got all sorts of crazy stuff. Well, it says as the USA battles with one of the coldest winters on record, a photographer has captured the amazing moment the sea almost froze. Now, I remember winters in my area colder than it's been this year, but they must be speaking of an overall majority. It says American photographer Jonathan Nymfro was walking along the beach in Nantucket in Massachusetts when he suddenly saw the ocean beginning to freeze. He took several pictures of a number of semi-frozen waves as they crashed against the coast. Mr. Nimifro, and I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Your guess is as good as mine. Nimfro, Nimfro. When I got to the top of the dunes, I saw that about 300 yards out from the shoreline that the ocean was starting to freeze. The high temperature that day was around 19 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, let's see, look at his pictures. There's another photo. Wow. I mean, that looks apocalyptic or something, doesn't it? Check that out. It says the waves resemble frozen slush crashing into the dunes and slurpy surf. Now, the wind was howling from the southwest, which would typically make rough or choppy conditions not good for surfing. But since the surface of the sea was frozen, the wind did not change the shape. That's kind of funny. Can you imagine somebody out there on a surfboard surfing and all of a sudden the ocean begins to freeze the look on their face that would be a great picture i bet that would go viral it says us wbz tv chief meteorologist said it looks like a big slurpee rolling ashore this is not the first time this year near frozen waves have been seen earlier this week niagara falls was pictured turning into a frozen waterfall and i'm going to pull that up in a second and show you in case you missed it Meanwhile, other waves were spotted frozen at Nova Scotia's Martinique Beach Provincial Park on Valentine's Day, turning the beach into icy dunes. Okay, so let's take a look at this, uh, this whole Niagara Falls incident. Here's a photo in case you missed it. There's a photo of the frozen falls right there. Let's see if they have some more. Hold on. Let's go back. Sorry, you have to see me search for a minute. Let's just look at images. That'll be the easiest. Check this out. Wow. Isn't that something? I mean, who would have ever thought we'd see it frozen like this? That is just a wild, wild looking, uh, wild looking pictures to see that happening. Let's see this one here. Yeah. 
So there you have seen the frozen Niagara Falls. Okay, now on to some brighter news here. Just a quick mention. Is this the childhood home of Jesus Christ? Expert identifies humble Nazareth house. It may not be the most luxurious of places, but this house could be where Jesus Christ was raised, according to an expert. British archaeologist Dr. Ken Dark believes he may have identified the humble first century home in Nazareth, northern Israel, as the place where Mary and Joseph brought up the Son of God. Should his theory be correct, it will solve a mystery which has baffled Christians for centuries. Dr. Dark has been researching the ruins since 2006 and has recently published his findings in well-respected journal, The Biblical Archaeological Review. Well, I want to know what this mystery is. It says in his article, Dr. Dark said that there was no good reason why the courtyard-style house was not the home of Jesus. The house is located beneath the Sisters of Nazareth Covenant, or convent, sorry, across the road from the Church of Annunciation, according to Dr. Dark. He described the property as being cut out of limestone and having a series of rooms and a stairway. One of the original doorways has survived, as well as part of the original chalk floor. The house was first identified as a site of special significance in the 1880s. Jesuit priest Henry Senses investigated in 1936, and then Dr. Dark's team followed up in 06. Well, heck yeah, if a Jesuit was involved, I surely believe this. I'm being rhetorical. In the article, Dr. Dark wrote, Great efforts had been made to encompass the remains of this building within the vaulted cellars of both the Byzantine and Crusader churches so that it was thereafter protected. Both the tombs and the house were decorated with mosaics in the Byzantine period, suggesting that they were of special importance and possibly venerated. A pilgrim text is said to be the key evidence linking the site to Jesus Christ. The text called De Locus Sanctus was written in 670 AD and is supposedly based on a pilgrimage made, by, made to Nazareth by a bishop who talked about a church where once there was the house in which the Lord was nourished in his infancy. Well, that seals it right there for me. I don't believe this is the home of Jesus Christ. That's up to you whether you do or not. It then describes two churches in Nazareth, one of which was the Church of Annunciation. He writes, the other stood nearby and was built near a vault that also contained a spring and the remains of two tombs. Between these two tombs was the house in which Jesus was raised. He added, was this the house where Jesus grew up? It's possible to say on archaeological grounds. On the other hand, there is no good archaeological reason why such an identification should be discounted. Huh? Maybe they will try to say when the Antichrist appears that uh, they'll find some DNA or something and they'll try to say this is the home of Jesus and it'll match the DNA of the Antichrist. Who knows? We never know. Do you know what to expect every day? I mean, did you expect to wake up today and find out that they're trying to um, possibly approve a donor body with a human head transplant or any of that crazy nonsense? Did you ever expect to see Niagara Falls uh, frozen or other freezing bodies of water that normally are never frozen or any of the other mess going on, including asteroids? So while the world is concerned with here, you can see on screen what Susanna Reed is wearing and how incredible her body looks. Those of us who are watching and waiting should be concerned about the signs of the times and the days and the hours in which we are living so that we as ambassadors of Jesus Christ can show the world that Jesus Christ is coming soon and that they need to prepare themselves and they need to repent and come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is the purpose. Should we as Christians who are really living in Jesus and are of the true body of Christ be afraid of these things? Absolutely not. However, I'm not going to lie, people living in unrepentance and disobedience, people who don't know Jesus, they should be afraid. They have every reason to be afraid. If you read through the book of Revelation, don't tell me that book is not a scary book and it is so part of the Bible. really need to be living in 
Jesus Christ now more than ever. Now, putting all prophecy aside, the only reason that any of us, sinners, righteous, whatever, wake up every day and have a heartbeat or breath in our lungs is because God Almighty has allowed it. So every day, every breath that enters and escapes your lungs, every beat of your heart, every bit of blood that flows through your veins is only because God has allowed it. Do you ever think about that? You're sitting here right now listening to this video, whether you're an evil person, a great person, whatever you are, whoever you are, God is letting you sit right there, right now, stand, whatever, because he loves you. He wants to give you another chance. And those of you who are um, right with God, he loves you very much. We're in the end times. He's still got a reason for you being here. You still have a huge purpose. No matter what it is you're doing, no matter what part of the body of Christ that you're involved in, the smaller parts, the larger parts, they're all big in God's eyes. Without the smaller parts, we couldn't have the bigger parts. It all works together. That's why I get so angry when people come and they um, put down, let's say, for instance, mine or another person's calling, which mine is being a watchman, as you've heard me say in videos. Why so much negativity? Why this and why that? Because time is that short. These are the things that are happening pertaining to the Bible. The book of Revelation is not a sugar sweet, uh, sugary sweet, um, happy go lucky book of the Bible. And these are the times we're living in. You're not going to hear all that stuff. That's not my call. My call is to wake people up, to show them how prophecy is unfolding, to show them that they need to repent and get right, and to warn them. A watchman's call, even in the Bible, is never that type of a job, so to speak. In Christ. God has plenty and plenty more of those people that are out delivering the um, love message and so forth and exhorting. And that is important. But then he's got those of us who are few and far between who are being watchmen. There are plenty of people who call themselves watchmen, though, that are delivering false messages. How many real watchmen who are delivering truth does he have? I would hope that I'm one of those. I pray over everything I deliver. Um, I ask God to lead me. I never would want to lead anybody astray ever. There is um, great trouble for that when I kneel before God. If I lead people astray, I'm going to get in trouble. So I, I don't want to do that. And I don't want to be any part of something negative that would cause someone to turn from God. Now, if the enemy comes and tempts you and lures you away from God because of something that someone delivers that is truth, that is on your hands. I have to deliver what the Lord tells me to. I have to do what he tells me. There's times I was going to do a video or a post on one thing, and I, it wasn't there. I was not inspired. That was the Lord letting me know, this isn't what I want you to do today. And he moved me into something else. So this is what I'm trying to do. Now, Look at the screen here. You can see a new article. It says, Dozen of more mysterious giant craters in Russia spark fears of looming natural disaster. What's this about? What's going on over in well, Russia? Well, let's find out. You can see the picture. That looks horrible. It says that four new mysterious giant craters and many smaller ones have appeared in northern Russia, sparking fears over a looming natural disaster in the Arctic. Observation from space has revealed the dramatic mushrooming of the holes believed to be caused by methane gas eruptions in melting permafrost due to climate change. Scientists revealed today, again, this is from February 24th, so um, it is not today in which you are listening to this video. Now, on the picture, it says, scientists said the Siberian craters were likely caused by, were likely caused by explosions from gas hydrates. A leading Russian expert sounded an alert over safety because one new Siberian crater surrounded by at least 20 baby holes is just six hole or six miles away from a major gas production plant. He predicts up to 30 more are waiting to be discovered. Scientists are still baffled by the exact processes causing the craters 
and respected Moscow expert professor Vasily Bogoyavlinsky, or let's see, Bogoyavlinsky, today called for urgent investigation of the new phenomenon amid safety fears. Now you can see here they've got it labeled B1, B2, B3, B4. It says this picture shows a map of the four craters. Okay, so these are the four the four craters. Until now, the existence of only three Siberian craters had been established. We know now of seven craters in the Arctic area, he told Siberian Times, referring to the larger holes. Now look here, you can see down inside of one. It says rising temperatures are believed to create ideal conditions for more craters. Five are directly on the Yamal Peninsula, once or one in Yamal Autonomous District, and one is on the north of Krasnoyarsk region near the Tamir Peninsula. We have exact locations for only four of them. The other three were spotted by reindeer herders. But I am sure that there are more craters on Yamal. We just need to search for them. I would compare this with mushrooms. When you find one mushroom, be sure there are few around. I suppose there could be 20 to 30 craters or more. Two of the newly discovered large craters, also known as funnels to scientists, have turned into lakes, revealed Professor Bogo Yavlinsky, deputy director of the Moscow-based Oil and Gas Research Institute, part of the Russian Academy of Scientists. Or Sciences. It is important not to scare people, but this is a very serious problem. We must research this phenomenon urgently to prevent possible disasters. We cannot rule out new gas emissions in the Arctic and in some cases, well, they can ignite. Here's some more photos. These are satellite images of the giant craters that have alerted scientists. The first hole was spotted in 2013 by helicopter pilots 20 miles from a gas extraction plant at Bovo and Yankovo on the Yamal Peninsula. An examination of the area using satellite images comparing landscapes in the past with the present day has alerted Russian experts to the prospect that the phenomenon is more widespread than first or originally thought. Experts are particularly interested in a crater they named B2, which just six miles to the south of the gas field at Boven and Kovo. Old satellite imagery shows no sign of craters at the site, but there now exists a lake 100 meters by 50 meters surrounded by 20 smaller holes filled with water. Now, these mini craters are just a meter or two in diameter, and following the discovery of a funnel at Anta Payatua, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, maybe I'm sure some of you do, Anti Payuta. On the Yamal Peninsula, nearby residents told scientists about seeing a flash of light, possibly as a result of gas exploding. You can see now right here. we are moving along to asteroids and asteroids and more asteroids. If you recall earlier in this video, I mentioned Efren Rodriguez's asteroid prophecy. Well, I did find a whole slew of articles, as I also mentioned, that would seem to support the prophecy that Efren Rodriguez has given. Let me show you some of them. Here we have on the screen scores of giant asteroids on course to hurdle past Earth within the month, NASA reveals. Okay, this article was published January the 1st of 2015. Now, I've got a whole slew, like I said, of information about different asteroids. So this one has already come and gone. But it seems like we have a whole bunch of asteroids in the past few years that are coming awfully close to Earth. It says some are more than one kilometers wide and threaten devastating consequences if they were to strike our planet. Now, wait till you see, and many of you may have already heard of it, what they've come up with. And if there's no risk, then why have they come up with this? And I'll show you that here in a second. It says of almost 70 asteroids on the radar, most are around 100 meters wide, the size of a double decker bus and would be capable of causing significant damage. Why? Because at the impact, you know, the speed at which they're hurtling towards the earth. Okay. 
Experts warn, if one of these monsters, some of which travel up to 70,000 miles an hour, were to hit the earth, it could alter life as we know it. Now, we know the book of Revelation specifically speaks of asteroids or comets, um, things the size of, the, of a mountain on fire being hurled toward the earth. It also talks about angels and um, th throwing balls of fire. So these things are prophesied. An impact would still be catastrophic, destroying cities and knocking out transport and communication networks. Let's move on to the next one. Now, before I move along, let's look at a verse, Revelation 8, 7. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. Right here, we've got another passage from Revelation. Okay, it says, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it unto the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Okay, then we have the first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of trees was burnt up and all of green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of that star is Wormwood. And third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened and the day show not for a third part of it and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Okay. So we see a lot of fiery things being tossed. Now here is something Earth. interesting. It says asteroid day, a global day of awareness slated for June 30th, 2015. More than 100 leading scientists, astronauts, and business leaders around the world have signed a declaration calling for the hundredfold increase in the detection and monitoring of asteroids. Astrophysicist Brian May, founding member and lead guitarist of the rock band Queen, joined Lord Martin Rees, the UK Royal Astronomer, at the London Science Museum today to host a press conference to announce Asteroid Day, a global awareness campaign to educate the world about asteroids. The event was linked to the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, where Ryan Wyatt, director of the Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization, hosted astronauts Tom Jones and Apollo 9 and so forth. It says a central focus of the event was the release of a 100 time declaration calling for the hundred fold increase in the detection and monitoring of asteroids. Okay, we've heard that several times now. Let's get to the meat of this. <laughs> Lord Reese read the declaration, which revolves to solve humanity's greatest challenges to safeguard our families and quality of life on Earth in the future. The declaration calls for three key actions. Number one, employ the available technology to detect and track near-Earth asteroids that threaten human populations. Number two, a rapid hundredfold acceleration of the discovery and tracking of near-Earth objects. Finally, number three, global adoption of Asteroid Day on June 30th, 2015 to heighten awareness of the asteroid hazard and efforts to prevent future impacts. The 100-time declaration was signed by more than 100 noted scientists, physicists, artists, and business leaders from 30 countries, including Richard Dawkins, Brian Cox, Anal Shea Ansari, Kip Thorne, Stuart Brand, investors Shervin Pishever and Steve Jervetson, Alan Eustace, and Peter Norvig of Google. Peter Gabriel Jane Liu, Helen Sharman, Jill Tarter, and more than 38 astronauts and cosmonauts. 
Okay, and you can see a full listing here. The more we learn about asteroid impacts, the clearer it becomes that the human race has been living on borrowed time, remarked Brian May. We are currently aware of less than 1% of objects comparable to the one that impacted at Tunguska, and nobody knows when the next big one will hit. It takes just one, in all caps there. So if there is no threat, why are we, why are we focusing on asteroids so much that we're going to have an asteroid awareness day to make people more aware of um, asteroids and the danger of them and to heighten our asteroid security, so to speak. Let's look at another article. Okay, here we have January 13th of this year. What can we do if an asteroid threatens Earth? Europe starts planning. What should humanity do the next time a space rock threatens the Earth? European officials recently spent two days figuring out possible ways to respond to such a scenario with the aim of drawing up effective procedures before the danger actually materializes. The first of its kind simulation considered what to do if an asteroid similar to or larger than the one that exploded over Russia in February of 2013, which was about 62 feet or 19 meters wide, came close to Earth. Officials focused on activities ranging from 30 days to one hour before a potential impact. There are a large number of variables to consider in predicting the effects and damage from any asteroid impact, making simulations such as these very complex. Now, the person who said that was, um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, I'm sorry, Detlef Koshny, head of near-Earth object activities at the European Space Agency Space Situational Awareness Office, said in a statement, these include the size, mass, speed, composition, and impact angle. He added, nonetheless, this shouldn't stop Europe from developing a comprehensive set of measures that could be taken by national civil authorities, which can be general enough to accommodate a range of possible effects. So my question is, why are we suddenly this year focusing so much on asteroids? We've got asteroid awareness, um, a global day of awareness slated for June 30th, asteroid day. We've got Europe planning for a major asteroid hit. Let's go to RT News. May Day, Queen guitarist warns asteroids threaten life on Earth. Okay, I just showed you that information. Let's go to National Geographic. Watch jumbo asteroids zip past Earth. Okay, this says a passing space, space rock should offer a rare, bright viewing treat for sky watchers. Yes, it will be such a treat when sky watchers stand outside to watch one that is headed for Earth that will do mass destruction. That should be a lot of fun. I'm sure there will be tons of uh, videos to upload if the person recording the video makes it al out alive out of that situation. Now, this was about... Um, one back in January, it says a mountain-sized space rock will sail past Earth on Monday, offering stargazers a close look at in interplanetary pin pinball. Now, I'm showing you this because look at all these close calls. It says that luckily NASA says there's no risk of collision, but it will be a rare astronomically close encounter that backyard telescope owners can watch. Now, this was a large asteroid called 2004 BL-86. It measured about a third of a mile or half a kilometer across. It will make its closest approach to Earth on January 26, which that already happened, coming within 745,000 miles or 1.2 million kilometers from our planet, about three times the distance separating the Earth and the moon. Here's another one, Tech Times. Large asteroids to, asteroids to fly by Earth in January through March, should humans worry. Asteroids are headed in Earth's direction, and with most of them about as wide as a double-decker bus, a collision would most likely result in significant damage. However, while experts warn against the potential dangers of these asteroids, they also say that it is unlikely that these will veer off course and hit the planet. According to NASA's Near-Earth Object Program, we just read about that on a previous article, there will be 43 asteroids flying close to Earth in January and 25 in February. In March, the number further drops to 15. 
The biggest threat for January is asteroid 2007 EJ slated to closely approach the planet on January 12th. With a maximum diameter of nearly one mile, the asteroid is traveling at around 34,500 5, 34, miles per hour. Okay, so the biggest asteroid after that would have been for the beginning of um, 19 or the beginning of the next month. Okay, so this is the next biggest asteroid threat for the first month of the year is the 1991 VE. It features, well, I'm sorry, the first month of the year, that would still be January. It features a diameter of 0.87 miles and is expected to skim past the planet on January 17th. Then on January 15th and 23rd, there was a 0.68 mile wide asteroid, or several of them, that flew by. Um, the 2014 UF206 and the 2062 Aten, or Aten. Okay, February 27th. That's already passed now. Um, 75 miles wide. It was called the 2003 YK118. It followed. On the same day, the biggest asteroid threat for the quarter, the 1.4 mile wide 2000 EE14, was also one that flew past. Here we are, March. So where are we now? So for March, the biggest an asteroid we'll get will be the 2002 GMT, which measures 0.68 miles in diameter. It is scheduled to come close to Earth on March 3rd. The 2000 EE14 will also not only be the biggest for the quarter, okay, that's the one that's coming this month, but it will also be flying by the closest coming in up to nearly 17 million miles with the proximity of the Earth's center. Okay, very important there. The thing that we need to understand, even though these asteroids to date have not done any damage, except for the one that hit over in Russia in 2013, I see this as a warning sign. God is sending all these asteroids fairly close to Earth to wake us up. It's making people think. It made people think enough that they came up with this asteroid awareness and preparedness. Okay, so if God is waking up the world to what he's doing, even though they may not be acknowledging him, what are you people who are Christians supposed to be doing? Waking up that this is the end times, that an asteroid will eventually hit the earth very soon. Let's go back to the article. Okay, we're in March now, and that's what we're speaking about. It'll be the biggest, and it is also going to fly the closest to Earth more than any of the others so far. It says, alarmed that about a million undetected asteroids are flying around in space right now, scientists launched Asteroid Day to raise awareness and prevent the disaster that happened 65 million years ago from happening as much as possible. Well, I've got news for them. They can aim their targets at asteroids all they want. If God deems that an asteroid is going to hit the earth because of end times prophecy that must be fulfilled, then they're not going to be able to do anything to stop it. According to NASA, the agency is aware of more than 1,500 PHAs or potentially hazardous asteroids. These are defined using perimeters that measures how big of a potential an asteroid has for dangerously coming close to the planet. But just because an asteroid has a high potential doesn't mean that it will impact Earth. Well, okay, so don't be concerned. We are NASA. We are scientists. We are God. That's what they think. Well, I have news for you. If you don't know Jesus Christ, and I'm going to use the F word, and you know what that word is? It's fear. Because we hear it is the F word among Christians today. If you tell people the truth, and if you're a watchman on the wall, you are a fear monger. You are presenting fear porn. Well, fine. If, if that's what you've got to call it, call it that then. Because, well, if you're in Christ, you shouldn't be afraid. But if you're outside of Christ, which means you're living in unrepentant sin and disobedience, or you're unsaved, and you don't know Jesus, and you're part of the world system, then you do have every reason to be afraid. Be afraid, because the Bible itself says it's scary. It refers to it as the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, for those Bible thumpers out there who only want to hear preached the love message, well, I have news for you that's unbiblical. The book of Revelation is in the Bible, whether you like it or not, and most of the Bible is prophecy, and there were what you're calling fear mongers all throughout the Bible. 
we would have to refer to Jesus as a fear monger because he gave us some shocking things to watch for that were not pretty or pleasant. We would have to call Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and John the Revelator fear mongers then. And if they're fear mongers, then so am I. Okay, because... These are things that we need to tell other people to wake them up to what's happening so they can be prepared physically and spiritually. Okay, now if you're a pre-tribber and you're out there saying, well, I don't need to know because I won't be here. Well, good for you. Um, That's awesome. I'm glad that you feel that way. Nonetheless, a lot of other people in your belief that you follow, there will be a lot of people left here. And according to what you believe, those people that are left here will have a second chance. So that being said, what's your excuse? Your excuse is you're not going to be here. So that means you're selfish. You don't care about all these people that are going to be left behind that are, according to you, going to have a second chance. So they don't need to know the truth while we're here to share the truth, right? Well, I'm not going to be part of that. I refuse to be part of this whole wishy-washy watered down Christianity. Um, I am very bold. I'm also humble. And I stand firm on what the Bible says. That is a form of love. A f- love, I don't know where people get this idea that love is, um, love is, you know, basically, I don't know a better word to use. One that comes to mind is not appropriate, but I guess I'll use it because it's all I can think of. Kissing butt. That's not love. Love is not telling people what they want to hear. Love is honestly and truthfully telling people what they don't want to hear if it is the truth. People may or may not receive you. It doesn't matter. You've got to tell the truth. We do not have enough truth tellers these days. Well, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time for me to, um, well, how do people put it? I have commentators that say that I'm not being gentle enough and whatnot. Well, most of you don't realize those that I'm being that way with are trolls. Okay. They come to my chain. They leave me messages all the time that you don't even see or that I delete. And so you don't know that if somebody displays a genuine earnest desire to know something, or they have an earnest, genuine concern or whatnot, then that's different. But I don't have time to play around. I really don't. We don't have time to play around. We've got enough people out there saying they're Christians that are spending all that time playing around and God doesn't have time for it. God doesn't have time for the nonsense. God is not happy. God is angry. So if you're seeing a little bit of that righteous anger in God's watchmen, that is the spirit of God himself coming out through that person and his anger. You don't think God's frustrated with all the naysayers. There's outright blatant sin and disobedience worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, I think, going on. And you think God's just up there patting people on the back, handing out candy. It's okay. You know, don't worry. Candy in a tissue. Just do your best. Is that how you see God? If you see God that way, that is unbiblical. There is not a single page in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that presents God as that type of a presence. The Bible presents God as omnipotent, powerful, God is love. Yes, but love is not this whole false wishy-washy stuff. Love does include gentleness. Love does include compassion. But God does show his compassion in the judgment that he pours out. That is how God gets people to repent. He gives us tons of chances before he does such a thing. But just like Israel in the Old Testament, people don't listen. People are not listening. So God is crying out loud. That's where you're getting all this boldness from that some of you are mistaking for anger. It is the voice of God crying out through his people boldly and loudly like never before because the stuff's getting ready to hit the fan. When you, um, I've used the kid running out of the street or getting poison example before. Let me use it again. If you see your kid running out in the street and a car is coming at 80 miles an hour or even possibly slower down the street, but that kid runs out in the street, are you just going to talk in a really meek, soft voice and say, um, no, get out of the street. You're going to get hit by a car. Come on. Or are you going to say, get out of the street. There's a car coming. You're, you're probably going to scream. Does that mean you don't love your kid because you're screaming at your kid to get their attention? No, it means you love your kid and 
they don't have much time before they're going to hit get hit by that car that's trucking down the road and you're trying to get their attention to get them out of the street you're trying to startle them okay so god's watchmen aren't necessarily going to be out here saying now listen here things are getting rough out there everybody need to put on your slippers keep a little warm keep your feet clean <clears throat> excuse me you know some ugly things might happen but it's okay don't worry about it just pray and just praise god and it's all going to be all right that is not what god wants right now is that going to wake people up is that going to startle the kid that's getting ready to run out in front of a car or about to ingest poison i mean look picture some kid about to drink something poisonous the mom comes around the corner or the dad sees the kid about to with the lips open about to drink it are you just going to say now now little johnny put that down no you're going to scream and yell you're going to get their attention that's what god's doing okay this isn't the time god doesn't have time for wishy-washy a ton of people are about to lose their soul for all of eternity and die God does not care so much about our physical mortal bodies unless he's got a purpose for us on this earth. If we do not have that purpose, then God doesn't care about that. Well, only for the only for the extended amount of time it takes you to get saved. Because when your mortal body dies, if you don't know Jesus, you're going to go to hell. So in turn, all he really cares about when your job is complete is your eternal person. And that is where you're going to spend eternity. He wants you with him. He doesn't want you to spend eternity in hell. Hell was not made for humans. God does not send people to hell. Satan leads you to hell and you choose to go to hell on your own. That is not God's doing. So that being said, it's time for people to wake up. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Let me show you a couple more things here. That's just an interesting photograph. That is a GIF image taken by NASA, which they shared um, through their deep space network antenna at Goldstone, California, and it is showing an asteroid with a moon, and it was one that safely flew past the Earth on the 26th of January. Okay, now here's another one here. You heard me mention the Near Earth Object Program with this whole asteroid awareness stuff. All right, so here's dates. We can see this is all of February. That's already passed. And then down here, you can see February. Every day in February, every day in March, February's already passed too. Every day in April that we're going to have a close encounter. And it's going to tell you the distance, the approach date, the estimated diameter, okay, and relative velocity. And I believe that's magnitude, but I'm not sure. So I'm not a scientist. Anyhow, this has been a long video. It was a real challenge today because of this tail end of this cold that I have. I've had a lot of trouble talking. <clears throat> Excuse me. But God said, I want you to do this video. So I have to do it. <laughs> I've had to stop, or restart, delete, stop and cut and edit a gazillion times while making this video. So it's not been an easy one, but I want to put this out here for you. We need to pray. We need to wake up. We need to realize God's not wishy-washy. He never was, never will be. Same God yesterday, today, and always. Jesus was not wishy-washy. Uh, so for some reason, the majority of the body of Christ has this image of Jesus as just this loving hippie guy who, you know, in the example I gave earlier, is holding a tissue in one hand and patting everybody on the back with the other you know giving you a piece of candy that is not how jesus is that's not how he operates the whole bible is supposed to be looked at as a whole the whole bible gives us the real image of god in the old testament we have the um the god who makes war we have the god who is angry at sin we have the god of judgment and wrath who does not tolerate sin, the God of law and rules. The Old Testament has not died. People who believe we're under the new covenant, which we are, which was Jesus Christ, believe the Old Testament is no longer valid. Well, God gave us the Old Testament for a reason, and it's still very valid, and we are still supposed to uphold the Ten Commandments. Okay, where, where did the Ten Commandments die off? We're not supposed to honor our mother and our father, um, we're supposed to go out and steal. No, we're still supposed to go by those in our lives. 
So um, the Bible gives us this whole image of God. And I said first, you know, the God of wrath, judgment, does not tolerate sin. Then we have the New Testament, which shows us the, the forgiving, loving God. And we see a bit of that in the Old, too. Remember, it's the whole book. And the God who's willing to sacrifice for us because he loves us that much so that we would not sin. But it never says that it's okay to go ahead and sin. God never changed his mind. People have this concept of the Bible from old to new. The old's the old God in the New Testament where God changes his mind. God never changed his mind. He's still the same God. Then, interestingly enough, we have the Bible ending just how it starts in a sense. The God of wrath, the God of judgment, the God who hates sin. Be assured, all throughout the whole Bible from start to finish and in between, God hates sin. He doesn't tolerate it. He gives you tons of chances. But in the end, if there's no repentance, God will make war with the unrighteous. Unfortunately, many of the righteous will also suffer just as they have in the Bible. People seem to think God is cruel or that somebody's implying God is cruel if if we who do these sorts of things mention that people are going to die, innocent people who are righteous are going to die and suffer. Well, God wouldn't do that. Show me in the Bible where God does not do that. What about Jesus? He was sinless. He suffered. Uh, Most of the disciples suffered horribly. Men in the Old Testament, I forget which one it was, Elijah, no, not Elijah, Ezekiel or Jeremiah, one of the two, um, was actually sawed in half. His feet and hands were bound and he was sawed in half. There was times for whatever reason, somebody's job wasn't done um, and people were about to suffer and God saved them out of it. So we never know what his plan is going to be, but don't tell me that Christians don't suffer. They're suffering right now over in the Middle East each and every day and their children and babies, innocent babies, die every single day, whether murdered or um, neglected or aborted. Okay, so don't tell me that God doesn't allow it. Okay, it's because of sin in the world. That's why. That's the reason for it. We're made of the world. What is the world? The world is sin. Our bodies are made from this earth, the dust of this earth. Our body is not perfect. Our body is part of the dust of this earth and belongs to the world. But our spirit, we can choose to give our spirit to God or Satan. Okay, if you give it to Satan, that means your spirit and your body both belong to the world. Okay, but the promise is that if you give your soul to Jesus Christ by acknowledging your sin, repenting, meaning turning away from your sin and asking Jesus to be the Lord of your life and you pick up that cross and carry it, it's painful. It's a painful journey. You're going to have to give up a lot. It's not easy. These people who tell you it is, they're lying. It's not easy. It's a difficult walk. It's treacherous, painful. Well, those of us who do that, we're not only promised eternity, but we're promised to be given a new body. Okay, so remember those things. Go forward in your day prayerfully. Praise God. Tell people about Jesus Christ. Time short, we don't have time to pussyfoot around. We don't have, just don't have time for it. Lots of things are going to be happening this year. I promise you this and next year. So stay tuned. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please click on my channel. If you're watching this on a web page, Click the YouTube icon at the bottom right of the video. Go to my channel and subscribe to me and be sure and select if you want to receive updates and whatnot or have it emailed to you so that you know when I post a new video. And uh, me and Lisa Haven's website is www.vineoflifenews.com. Check us out. Thanks so much and God bless you. Attention all of humanity, this is not a test. Drop to your knees immediately and submit to your master, the government. Everything that you thought was conspiracy has just become reality. Welcome to the New World Order. Enjoy the Mark of the Beast. And above all else, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for submitting, and please remember, we are always watching you.